Just who are you trying to please? Just who are you trying to please? I think that's a good question. I think it's such a good question, it works out to have a sermon built around it. Just in this case is only, just who are you trying to please? Paul wrote to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 15 in verses 1 through 3, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good edification. For even Christ pleased not himself. Romans 15, 1 through 3. I think in an honest evaluation of any one of our lives, some more so than others, we see that selfishness stands in the path of true devotion. And anybody that's going to be truly devoted to Christ based upon his word is going to have to consider that about himself or herself. Now the carnal man seeks to please himself in everything. But to be a follower of Christ, The old selfish man of sin must be destroyed. Paul said to the Colossians in Colossians 3, verses 5 and 6, mortify, that's a word we don't use much anymore. It'll say in other versions, put to death. Mortify, therefore, your members, which upon the earth, that's talking about our physical body, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Are these things significant? Yes. And remember, he wrote this to Christians. For which cause the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Again, Colossians 3, 5, and 6. Now that one, those two verses, I should say, Describes pretty much what motivates the world, how the world acts, how the world thinks, what the world loves. So it's essential that it being converted to Christ and all that convert means, that these things be put to death. How do I put them to death? I choose those things and I cultivate those things and I leave things alone that would cause these things mentioned in these two verses, to be encouraged for us to dwell on them, to let them be the guiding light, if you please, of our lives. It's absolutely essential that the old man's selfishness must die. The scripture reads, again, dealing with this kind of thing in our individual growth and development in the Lord's church as Christians. For if after or for if ye live after the flesh, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify, there's that word again, the deeds of the body, ye shall live, Romans 8, 13. Living to please self is nothing more and nothing less than spiritual suicide. If it's not, I don't know the meaning of these verses and others like them. I don't know what they're telling me to do. I don't know what they're trying to get me to change. We noted that Jesus didn't please himself. In fact, I'm just using Romans 15, 1 through 3 as basically a text. But in John 5, 30, listen to what he said. I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father that hath sent me. Then again, 
in John 6 and verse 38. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Now there's our pattern. Can't get any better than that. When it comes to a pattern of how to live life on earth in the flesh. Only this kind of self-sacrifice could lead Jesus Christ to accomplish that which God had set before him. So we read over in Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, Though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered. And then he says, And being made perfect, which means complete for the job set before him, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Have you ever wondered why Jesus spent over three years in his earthly ministry? Why didn't he spend just six months, a year, two years? He never sinned, though he was tempted in every point like we are. So why, why do all of this? Well, knowing that God doesn't expend any more energy, it's called divine parsimony, than is necessary. There's nothing wasted about what God plans to do or to do or the actual involvement of doing it. And then Jesus was here for the exact amount of time it took for him to do what he came to do. Now, what was going on in those three years or so? Well, I think Hebrews 5, 8, and 9 tells us. He was putting himself through what he needed to as a human being to be able to be the sacrifice. The lamb done before his shears, so he opened on his mouth. To be the sacrifice for us, to die on our behalf, to experience all that he did. Some people may have a problem knowing that God's omniscient, which means the deity knows all that's the object of knowledge. But because God knows in that way what temptation and sin is, doesn't mean God in the form of deity as it was before Jesus came in the flesh, John 1, 1 and 2 and verse 14, that he had experienced it. There's a difference in knowing something, even from our standpoint, limited as we are, and in going through it, experiencing it. And so it is Christ to experience what you experienced, I experienced, had to become someone who could experience it. Thus the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, John says. So he could be tempted to sin. And thus we have the record of him being tempted. Which means Satan solicited him to violate God's law. So all the time he spent here is just enough time, no more, no less, for him to become the author of eternal salvation and do all them that obey him. And thus we have the statement preceding that, though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered. Now that may help us sometimes in being a, striving to not be selfish and self-willed. To understand, uh, we have to bring those things into subjection to the teachings of Christ. And therefore, we don't please ourselves, we please God. So we bring the appetites of the flesh under the governing powers of the will of Christ set out in the word of Christ. And in that way, God's ordained that we mold a character in the likeness of Christ. That's the work process. That's the machinery. Have you ever seen some of these machines that they start out with maybe just a piece of metal and then after it goes through this, that, and the other and all the banging and knocking and whatever the machines are designed to do, it comes out. Maybe it's an eating utensil. Maybe it's a real nice pan or something. But it had to go through usually a lot of heat and a lot of banging and knocking and 
squeezing and whatever for it to come out that way. Now, I know that's an army of the scriptures for Peter likens it to us living the Christian life in this world. And I say us, I mean Christians. Talking about it being tried by fire. Paul talks about that too. And if you want to make uh, gold better, you burn the impurities out of it. The fire has to get hot enough to do that. Well, that's where we are as we live in this life. So we pray to be like Christ, but we don't understand the process of being like Christ, of getting from point A to point B. We see it in everything around us. I've always stood amazed at people who could make pots and a vase or something like that out of pottery, how they could mold it with their hands. But that's what we are. And thus, there's a song that says, molded and made after his will while I'm yielded and still the potter and the clay. Thou, speaking of God, is the potter. Now, what we're talking about in this sermon is the clay. <laughs> Mold me and make me after thy will. Notice, while I'm yielded and still. When you fire that pottery and it's dried, it's not yielded anymore. It won't yield. It'll break, but it won't yield. I think sometimes we fail to see how even in life itself, there's great lessons when you know the truth of God's Word, what life's all about, that shows us how to handle the things of life and why, as Christians, in seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, that we are made in the likeness of Christ. Paul says that Jesus Christ made Himself of no reputation. And took on him the form of a servant. And was made in the likeness of men. Being, and being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself. And became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. Philippians 2, 7 through 8. There's that metal going through all the banging, knocking, and all what the machine's designed to do until it comes out as it was. So Christ is the one that's blazed the trail for us. He's gone on ahead. As Peter says, he's left us an example that we should follow in his steps. Well, he submitted himself to his Father's will for a reason we couldn't do. He was sinless. Thus, he could die on behalf of others. He didn't need to die for any sin he had done, where he did no sin. So he could die for us. But he's left us that example that as members of his spiritual body, citizens of his kingdom, we do the same thing. We strive to bring every thought into subjection to Jesus Christ. Paul said after he preached to others that he buffeted his body and brought it in subjection, lest after having preached to others he himself was a castaway. Because his will, that is Christ's will, was to serve others. Above all, serving his Father. Because his Father's will was for him to serve others. Then Jesus could face death's rigors and a shameful death pain and anguish upon the cross and what does he pray in the garden not my will but thine be done so this was the purpose in coming to earth if you read Matthew 20 and verse 28 here's what you'll find even as the son of man came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many so Jesus in coming to this sin cursed world to experience sin as we experience the consequences of sin and he experienced the temptation to sin and the consequences of a sinful world was upon him though he did no sin then he said now you take up your cross daily and follow me. 
So he is serving his father as a man on this earth for our benefit than he was serving us. And his primary concern was to do the will of the father and please him. So Christ did not please himself in doing what it took to save us from sin. Consider the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. Concerning his work in delivering the truth of God, specifically the New Testament, Jesus had this to say to the apostles of Christ concerning the work of the Spirit with them after he had returned to heaven. In John 16, 13, and 14, how be it when he... The spirit of truth is come. He will guide you into all truth. He shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me. For he shall receive of mine and show it unto thee. Again, John 16, 13 and 14. Do you know one of the marks, a chief mark of a person who really, though he may claim to have the same relationship with the Holy Spirit the apostles did, do you know the chief mark of him not telling the truth and believing a lie? Is that they go around all the time talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit this, and the Holy Spirit that, and the Spirit this, and the Spirit that. When this verse right here, Jesus plainly says, He will not glorify Himself. He will glorify me. And yet all these people who want to claim miracles like Jesus did and the apostles did and the gifts that existed in the early church, all they do is talk about the Spirit. But if you read your Bible, the people who had those miracles by the Spirit talked about what person? Jesus Christ. So one of the signs that people just don't have the miraculous works they claim to have or relationship with the Holy Spirit that the apostles had, they talk about it all the time. They glorify the Holy Spirit. But Jesus said a long time ago, he won't glorify himself. He'll glorify me. He will take a mind and show it unto you. That doesn't seem hard to understand. The Holy Spirit didn't come to glorify his office. The Holy Spirit didn't come to glorify his own person or his personality. He came to reveal the truth of God in the Word of God. Now, if you'll notice at the very beginning, verse 13 of John 16, that we started out with Jesus saying to the apostles, how be it when he... Now, watch where it puts the emphasis on what the Spirit was going to do with these apostles. How be it when he... Listen, the Spirit of what? Of truth. That's where Jesus is aiming. What's that Holy Spirit going to do with you apostles? He's going to guide you into all truth. He's going to remind you infallibly of everything you've ever heard from me. But notice, it's the truth of Jesus Christ. It's the New Testament. So his work, the Holy Spirit's work, was to reveal Christ through the word of Christ. Jesus promised, but when the comforters come, whom I will send unto you from the Father. Notice again, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he, the Spirit, shall testify of me, John 15, 26. Again, the Spirit himself who empowered the apostles did not glorify himself. The Spirit who revealed the truth Christ gave him and infallibly guided them to set it down, did not at all glorify himself. So it pleased God to send his Holy Spirit to instruct man in ways of salvation. I think a great many people in their 
trying to understand and being mixed up on the work of the Spirit with man has failed to realize that the third person of the Godhead, even in the material creation, has always been pictured as the one who reveals, who organizes, and who confirms. And that's what he did with the New Testament. The Holy Spirit inspired men who delivered the gospel. Remember, that's God's power to save, Romans 1.16. It's what we ought to be thinking about. When we go into all the world, we preach what the Holy Spirit revealed. But we don't necessarily put it that way. We could. The Bible does. But we say we preach the gospel. And when Jesus commissioned the, the apostles originally to go out and preach, he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. But in all the revelation and confirmation of that great and marvelous word of God, the Holy Spirit never acted in self-interest. He did not come to please men, but to serve man in presenting God's terms of pardon that Jesus had given him. And his primary concern then was to please the Father. It just simply goes to show that in the three persons of the great Godhead, of the one essence which is God, they each had their assigned roles. It was not the assigned role, for lack of a better way to put it, with the limitations of human language. It was not the assigned role of the first person of the Godhead of the Father to become flesh. He's the one that's always pictured by the revelation of the Holy Spirit to be the one who, within whom all authority lies, or inheres, we might say. He's the one that gave authority to Christ, Matthew 28, 18. For a period of time. He's the one that uh, comes up with the plan. Christ is always pictured. The second person of God had is the executor. He carries it out. The Holy Spirit is the revealer and the confirmer. And they consistently operate in that way. And any one of them that does something as that particular person because of the divine essence that is God, then God did it. Jesus did what he did, God did it. Father did what he did, God did it. The Holy Spirit did what he did, God did it. Because those three are the one divine essence. And looking at the apostles of Christ, we might get a little insight as to what Christ was looking for when he searched their hearts in choosing them. I think Paul is the greatest of examples among them of unselfish attitude and actions. Notice what he said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 33. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. How did he form that view? Why would he hold that attitude? Why would he put it into practice? Because that's what he saw in Christ. Paul was not pleasing all men that he might become popular. You don't see anything about Paul that says, I'm, I'm going to be popular. Rather, he states the reason for his conduct, that they may be saved. Then again to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 19. He said, though I be free from all men, yet I have I made myself a servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Now in both those passages, the ultimate end all that Paul's doing is save soul. And further, he said, I made all things to all men that I might by all means have some, save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. As we work for souls that are lost in sin, as we grow to love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ more, and especially to love men lost in sin as God in Christ loved them, 
then we'll begin to be able to say what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, 15. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. I would say until a person can reach a stage that what, that's what he's trying to do, he's got some selfishness that need to be worked out of him. The work of the apostles did not make them popular with the world. That's a statement that really doesn't need to be made. Anybody knows anything much about the Bible. Paul portrayed their plight in these words. Even into this present hour, we hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We're made the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. First Corinthians 4.13 now, it's just his way of saying, I undergo all of this to save your soul. I put myself where I am to please God because it had to do with why I'm on earth in the first place and how to save the souls of men. These men were not self-seekers. They didn't seek to please men. Paul would even say it to the Galatians, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Galatians 1.10. Of course, that didn't mean the apostles were around as other faithful members of the church of the first century and just sought to stir up a fight for the sake of a fight. But it meant they weren't going to compromise the truth and they weren't going to hold back truth needful for what the church needed. So the apostles served all men. Because they please God at all times. So I can't, to make the story all come together, I can't be faithful to God as a child of God and please self. Now our text that we started with states that we should not act to please ourselves but to please others. And again, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 24 reads, Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. And to see how this kind of thinking fits the faithful child of God, he said to Philippians, in Philippians 2, verses 4 and 5, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Then he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And now we know the source of all of it. We know why Paul was what he was, why he wrote all those things that he wrote. He walked in the footsteps of Christ. We are followers of Christ, therefore in all things, but in our lesson this afternoon, especially in unselfishness. When we seek, as we learned earlier in the lesson, to please ourselves, that's spiritual death. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, Jesus said. And whosoever shall lose his life in this world shall preserve it, Luke 17, 33. So I can't think, well, now what is that going to cause me to have to give up here that I really like to do? When it comes to serving God, I just don't think I'll do that. I'll let somebody else do it. I'll sit by and choose the easy way with my feet up in the easy chair. Well, this destroys even true hope, true expectation of heaven, true desire for heaven. And as true, genuine, faithful disciples of Jesus, we must walk in his steps. And the scripture says in Acts 10 verse 38, that he went about doing good. Paul would instruct the young preacher Timothy to charge the rich in this world that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves 
a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. Well, that was Timothy. What do you have to say to Titus, another young preacher? He said it this way. This is a faithful saying. And these things will will that I will that thou affirm constantly, not haphazardly, but constantly with regularity, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men, Titus 3.8. Now when you think about what we've already seen from Paul's pen, about he came not to please himself, to please the Lord, all the things he did, he had mind-saving souls then we understand what he's telling Titus here. Saints are told, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves, our brethren, and to all men, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 15. So am I unselfish? Well, I have to ask that question. Am I unselfish not only to my brethren, but to other people? Everybody, in fact. Even though we are primarily interested in the body of Christ because of what one goes through in becoming a member of the church, what that evidence is in their life, in their conversion process, they are children of God. We still are mindful of letting that develop in us working to develop it in us of the idea of putting to death selfishness and being self-willed. To the Galatians, Paul said, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those who are the household of faith, Galatians 6.10. It all comes down to this. If we serve God according to the authority of His Son and the will of His Son, manifest in the Word of Christ, the perfect law of liberty, we will serve others. We will not be selfish. And wherein we are, we'll work on it. Yes, we are a work in progress. But I don't say that about people who have renounced the Lord or who have said, well, I've come as far as I'm going to go. I don't need to change any further. I say that about people who are always striving and reaching ahead. As Paul said, that he pressed forward to the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Why? Because he says, I have yet attained. Well, I assure you, if Paul could say that, we all can say it. To strive to give the proper study of the Word of God, and yet do it all as we love each other as brothers and sisters in God's great family, and that we're mindful of helping each other because we're unselfish, to even be unselfish in all things. Well, let's see. If I close this sermon right, I'll just simply say, just who? Just who are you trying to please? And after having asked that question, it seems good then to say, here's a good place to put the invitation, Christ's invitation, the faithful brethren's invitation to become a Christian or to be restored. If you need to obey the gospel, we know what it takes to become a Christian here. If as a child of God you sin, it's privately known to you and God, take care of it there, repent of it, confess it, ask Him to forgive you. If your life has brought reproach on the church by your sins, then make it as public as it was committed. That is your repentance. We come to a point of a decision making. Just who are you willing to please? We'll answer that question while we stand and sing this song.